Welcome to Lost in Stanley, presented by David Mould with Stores Library. My name is Lindsay and I will be facilitating this evening. Four years after the fall of the Soviet Union, David Mould landed in Osh, the second largest city, city in Kyrgyzstan, to establish a training center for local journalists. He found himself in a country going through wrenching economic, social, and political change. In the December snow, families throw blankets on the sidewalk, selling what they had to buy food and fuel. The experience made a deep impression. David returned to Kyrgyzstan the next year for a Fulbright Fellowship and made frequent trips to the country and its northern neighbor, Kazakhstan, over the next 20 years for teaching, research, and consulting. For the five stands, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, shaking off the legacy of 75 years of Soviet rule has not been easy. The transition to a market economy has been difficult and some people, especially in rural areas and small cities, feel worse off than in Soviet times. David Mould, PhD, Professor Emeritus of Media Arts and Studies at Ohio University, has traveled widely in Asia and South, Southern Africa. Born in the UK, he has worked as a newspaper and TV journalist before moving to the US. His travel essays and articles have been published in Newsweek, Christian Science Monitor, Times Higher Education, and History News Network. His books include Monsoon, Postcards, Indian Ocean Journeys, and Postcards from Stanland, Journeys in Central Asia. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Lindsay, and thanks to the store's library. Um, can we, let's see, I'm going to just share the screen here. Okay. And start there. And I think I should begin by just explaining the title of this series, the Accidental Travel Writer Series. I think I said the, this on the first time I presented a month ago. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I've never had the privilege of having somebody pay me to go somewhere to actually write about the place. Uh, the travel writing that I've done has taken place uh, while I've been on assignment, teaching, training, research to somewhere and I kind of write as I go. So here I am, a little less grey hair than I have today, uh, meeting a Kazakh Batir. He would be a, an 18th century warrior chief. I don't know that he was actually as large as he looks in, in this statue. And I'm at a resort in the Tian Shan Mountains in the middle of winter outside Almaty, the former capital of, uh, capital of Kazakhstan. Uh, so as Lindsay said, I, I travelled pretty frequently to uh, Central Asia over a 20-year period. And um, the first place that I went to, as she mentioned, was this place you'll see on the map called Osh in southern um, Kyrgyzstan. Um, that was in December 1995. <clears throat> and my writing really started with sending emails from Osh in December 1995. Um, at that time, um, well, it was kind of the early days of email, I found one computer in the city at the university that had a dial-up connection. You remember how that went? Uh, took about 30 minutes, a lot of electronic whirring to send a message. But I, I, I described the city where I'd been working and um, the struggles its peoples faced uh, four years after the fall of the Soviet Union. And as Lindsay mentioned, it was a pretty tough time for people there. Um, factories and shops were closed. The country was in a deep 
economic slump. Inflation was running, well, never, nobody really knew how much it was running out, but some estimates was 300% a year. So that made pensions and savings almost worthless. And people were literally out on the streets with blankets spread on the sidewalks, selling their household goods, their pots and pans and blankets and uh, clothes, just to buy money for food. There were power cuts almost every day. Um, this is my first experience working in a developing country and it made a, a deep impression on me. And so over the years I returned, I returned oh, uh, less than a year later to do a Fulbright and um, and more frequently after that. So I, st I kept writing travel essays, not really thinking about what would happen to them in the end. Um, and I wrote a, a little bit about big picture stuff, about what was happening in politics and the media, which was my, my area of expertise or area of research and teaching. But mostly I wrote about the sort of the everyday challenges of living, shopping, travel, working, trying to keep warm and speaking really bad Russian. So, oops, let's see, oops, ah, uh, my, my screen is frozen a bit. I'm going to stop share here, go back to my, uh, anyway, let's see, let's, uh, sometimes that happens. All right, um, uh, so 20 years later, I realized I had a book I needed to write. It's the one on the left, Postcards from Stanland. I'll just explain Stanland a little later on. Um, but by, my, by themselves, those personal experiences were not enough. I needed to add some research. I needed to add interviews. Um, and um, you know, I called it Postcards because I sort of thought of my experiences as a series of scenes. And then later on, when I worked in other areas of the world, including the Indian Ocean region, I had another book out uh, 2019 on Madagascar, India, Bangladesh and Indonesia. And the third book, most recently last year, Postcards from the Borderlands, uh, looks at experiences crossing borders, both sort of real borders, but also perceptual and imagined borders in many countries. Anyway, let's go back to... December 1991, which was four years before I arrived in the former Soviet Union. And imagine for a moment that you're a Soviet citizen, you're living in Almaty, which at that time was the capital of the, uh, the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. You're a factory worker, for example. Uh, one morning you go to work and you read, as you're expected to, uh, today's edition of Kazakhstanskaya Pravda, uh, Kazakhstan Truth. Um, and it announces the dissolution of the Soviet Union and says, congratulations, you're now a citizen of an independent country, Kazakhstan. You talk with your co-workers, what does it all mean? No one has any idea at all. Um, although the Soviet bloc collapsed pretty dramatically on TV in Eastern Europe, the fall of the Berlin Wall, for example, in Central Asia, this region of the Soviet Union, it was a quiet revolution. Apart from a few intellectuals, really nobody was campaigning for independence. Unlike colonial liberation struggles in um, Africa or other Asian countries, there's no army coming out of the mountains or the jungles to be cheered by flag-waving crowds. There's no government in exile. There are no heroes or martyrs to freedom. Simply what happened is that citizens of each Soviet Socialist Republic woke up one morning in December 1991 and suddenly found themselves citizens of a new independent country. And this is how the new map looked. So for a few weeks, your life goes on as normal. You've got your apartment, you've got your job, your children go to school. The political leaders, the people running the country, are the same crowd as was running the 
Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. No change in the leadership there. But by the end of the month, by the end of December, you start noticing changes. The shops, which never had a great range of goods anyway, um, have even less. There's no meat today or no milk today. Prices are rising. At school, your child's teacher complains she hasn't been paid for weeks. You go to the clinic and surprise. Um, the doctor is not here. He left for Germany. He migrated. A few weeks later, you show up at your factory and find that the gates are closed. The manager says there are no more orders. Everyone's out of a job. Most Soviet citizens had no idea of what was coming or how it would change their lives forever. Under the Soviet central planning system, um, industrial agricultural production was determined by targets and quotas, which had absolutely no relationship to demand or the market. So stuff just piled up in rail cars or rotted in warehouses. And it would take many years, some would say even till today, for these new countries to adapt to a, the so-called free market. And for people who grew up lived and worked in a system to start looking at the world and themselves in new ways to find a new identity. So the collapse of the Soviet Union gave us 14 new countries plus Russia, including the five so-called stands of Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Lindsay, I'm sorry you had to struggle with the pronunciation on some of those. Uh, 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, we're still lumping these countries together and mixing them up. There are many examples of this, but I'll keep my critique strictly bipartisan. So uh, um, John Kerry, former Secretary of State, addressing USAID um, staff, referred to the country of Kazakhstan. He combined Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, invented a new country. Um, President George W. Bush didn't do much better. Reportedly, when Condoleezza Rice was advising him or briefing him about Uzbekistan, he's reported to have said, Stan who? And American ignorance, or perhaps ignorance, or better describes it, of the geography of Central Asia famously lampooned in this cover of the December 10th, 2001 edition of the New Yorker, three, three months after the December 11th attack, when suddenly this region of the world was absolutely in the headlines. So this is a New Yorkistan cartoon, which um, takes the five boroughs of New York and individual neighborhoods and it mixes local and in fact Yiddish names with suffixes common in Central Asia and the Middle East. So so we have extra stan, hip hop bad I love, uh, Kandiba and uh, it, it's fun. You can you can you can look this up on Google and uh, and laugh for a bit about New Yorkistan. Um, this is how I describe the region. And for years I had the challenge of trying to explain Central Asia to colleagues, students and friends. And that's actually where I came up with the title for the book. After one trip to Kyrgyzstan, a university colleague insisted I'd been in Kurdistan, which does not yet exist as a country, except in northern Iraq and in the maps of Kurdish separatist movements. Kurdistan as such as in, um, in, in Iraq, Syria and Turkey. And so I was trying to explain to him where I'd been and he was looking at puzzled. And he said, oh, you've just been in Stanland, okay? All those countries whose names end in Stan. And that actually is total nonsense because in Persian the word Stan means land. So literally I'd been in Landaland or Lala Land. Um, so how did things turn out this way? To explain how Central Asia became the way it is, we need to look at history. So let's go back, uh, indeed, you know, um, to the, um, you know, the early, you know, early to mid 
19th century. And this is kind of how Central Asia looked then. And you had these khanates, these medieval kingdoms, um, um, ruled by ruled by traditional rulers and some other areas which are you know less defined more tribal areas and the Khans um, kings uh, would be the translation they were kind of throwbacks to medieval despots they had lavish palaces and courts and gardens they had harems and they have slave markets um, more importantly though they controlled trade routes agricultural lands and natural resources this is you know this area is part of the ancient silk road to china um, so while the khans were busy fighting each other um, imperial russia was expanding and throughout the 19th century or the latter part of the 19th century and i find it really interesting because it's a very close parallel to what was happening in the united states at the time the 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 russian frontier was ex this is the american frontier was expanding west the russian frontier was expanding east towards siberia and towards central asia and again the armies led the way there were the railroad builders the came after them followed by the settlers seeking farmland so at this point you can sort of see how um, Russia Imperial Russia uh, colonized this region of the country and there were a few motives for expansion one of them was economic uh, in 1861 with the American Civil War in the United States exports of American cotton were cut off to Russia so Russia had to turn to other regions for supply and the climate and the soil of the southern part of this region the so-called Fergana Valley um, was um, considered ideal for cotton growing so um, cotton was raised there to supply Russia's textile mills with the supply from the United States cut off and Russia also looked to the region for other raw materials and mineral resources and there's a market for manufactured goods and then there were territorial ambitions Russia's great dream was to secure an overland passage to India and for the British who were the colonial power in India this was a nightmare and so for half a century Russia and Britain competed for influence and trade in a vast region broader than this it included Tibet and Afghanistan in what became known to historians as the great game uh, so Russia was always the invading force here the invader and after the Bolshevik Revolution when the Soviets took over this region political leaders took advantage of a power vacuum declared independent republics but the Red Army quickly crush them so how did the Soviets retain control over this region <clears throat> they were very worried about religion because nominally most of the people living in this region were Muslims and they were also worried about tribal nationalities so what they did was they literally gerrymandered Central Asia into Soviet socialist republics and constructed kind of artificial nationalities you'll see why in a moment um, with with um, within borders of Soviet socialist republics so your loyalty was no longer to your tribe your village or your faith but to your nationality as a Kazakh Kyrgyz Tajik Turkmen or Uzbek and to its Soviet Socialist Republic now um, at the same time the Soviets uh, um, moved a lot of people out of Central Asia to other parts of the Soviet Union so Central Asians people from who were originally from you know the mountains of Kyrgyzstan turn up in the Baltic republics and in Ukraine and Moldova and all over the place so the Soviets moved people out they moved Russians Volga Germans they moved uh, uh, Ukrainians into the region so there was a lot of sh shifting around deliberate shifting around of nationalities here but here's what happened in Central Asia 
the borders were very artificial. And so the medieval cities of Samarkand and Bukhara, wonderful places you'd be able to visit, these were historically major centers of Tajik culture. Um, but the Soviets put them into the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. So deliberately dividing up the Tajiks. At the same time, a lot of Uzbeks ended up in the Tajik Soviet Socialist Republic. And look at the map at the top here. You can sort of see how the borders go. There's this bit of Tajikistan that's sort of you know, it's kind of, it's more than a panhandle, the whole area um, um, to the north in the valley. And uh, there are high mountains between it and the rest of Tajikistan. Um, uh, Uzbekistan bisects southern Kyrgyzstan. I mean, it, it, I mean, we talk about gerrymandering in terms of electoral boundary and things like this, but this is gerrymandering, ethnic gerrymandering on a great scale. So here's what um, happened here. Um, the you know this is where these the Soviet socialist republics ended up at independence in 1991. And uh, there's two quotes there: one from the from the New York Times, the other one from the big name of Brzezinski, the Eurasian Balkans. And this reflects the fact that the Soviets had moved all these people around and that, um, um, you know, some, you know, that most countries had a whole mix of groups. So look at the 1989 census for the Kazakh SSR, as it was then, Kazakhs are, you know, the largest group, but still a minority in their own country, almost as many, almost as many Russians and a lot of other people as well. So a real, real ethnic muddle. So all countries have experienced migration and after 1991 many Russians left the region, I guess they read the tea leaves and the samovar and went, mm, not much of a future for us here in a republic where the people that we used to dominate in politics and the economy, education, have taken over everything. Um, and actually there was a huge brain drain. So Russians left uh, and this had a huge economic effect. I mean, I, I, I sort of remember that often the people who were heads of ministries or rectors of universities were native Kazakhs or native Kyrgyz. It was usually often the number two person who was a Russian who actually knew what was going on and what to do. But definitely there was a huge power shift towards the ethnic groups. So these are Kyrgyz. The guy in the middle is wearing the traditional hat, the Kolpak. I have like seven of these, I think they were often given to me. Um, and uh, they're sitting on in a yurt, a traditional tent uh, with felt rugs or sherdaks uh, on, on the walls and floor. One of my favorite pictures, I took it in southern Kyrgyzstan, a bunch of little Kyrgyz boys. And this is foreign aid at work. They're showing off their Lever Brothers bars of soap. And here's a boy in a kolpak and uh, two girls in traditional dress in Kyrgyzstan's capital, Bishkek, which is where my wife Stephanie and I um, lived. Um, and but at the same time, uh, the picture on the top there, those are Uzbeks in uh, in Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. Um, I kind of note the note the sort of on a couple of the traditional caps. These are guys um, in the south uh, um, se selling bread, selling lipioshki. Um, so it's it's. Uh, it's an interesting mix. I mean, people, you know, all of these republics call themselves the Islamic Republic of. But, I mean, you know, religious practice varies widely from conservative to liberal. And in fact, these are Islamic republics where you can buy a bottle of vodka on almost every street corner. And there have been flare-ups between ethnic groups, mostly over land and natural resources and political control. 
which is to be expected when you gerrymander borders and you put fairly significant ethnic minorities into, into places where another group's going to dominate. Um, one interesting symbol of how these countries sort of deal with their history, deal with their past, is the Lenin statue. And I, I, I'm sure you've seen pictures of this, um, you know, in Eastern Europe and uh, the Baltic states and other places, uh, crowds, you know, pull down the Lenin statues, cheering. Um, but in Central Asia, um, they kind of left them standing most of the time, you know, they were much more relaxed about it. Um, the picture on the right here is of uh, Lenin in on uh, uh, Chui Prospect in Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. And, you know, he just stood there for a while until they eventually took him down and moved. But I mean, the joke was was that he was trying to direct traffic or hail a taxi on one of the city's busy streets. Now, eventually they moved him to a more discreet location and replaced him with a, a more appropriate national statue. Um, uh, but the row over the Lenin statues, and uh, here's my half friend Nicholas trying to adopt a Lenin pose in a park in Bishkek, um, you know, uh, kind of reflects a sort of a schizophrenic attitude to the Soviet past. Yes, there was control. Yes, you know, things were bad. Yes, people were exiled and people were killed. But hey, you know, everybody had a job and everybody had an apartment. Everybody had free education and free medical care. And now suddenly in this free market that you've thrown us into, things were a lot less certain. One of the other visible signs, and oh, there's a great quote from the uh, deputy in the, uh, speaking in the Russian Duma. Lenin was a founding father of the Russian Federation, just the same as George Washington. Very simple, isn't it? Um, one other symbol was the changing of street names, uh, which you find, you know, often happens in countries when they become independent from a colonial power. And in Bishkek, Stephanie, my wife and I, lived on a street called Ulitsa Razakova, Razakov Street. And I had to look up Razakov, and his, his name was Ishkak Razakov, and he was the first secretary of the Communist Party in the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic in the 1950s for about 10 years until he fell out of favor with Khrushchev and then got exiled. Um, but you say, said Razakova to people and they gave you black stares, you know, and certainly the cab drivers didn't know where Raz, uh, Ulitsa Razakova was. But if you said Biva Maiskaya, the first of May Street, ah, Konechna, Pani Mayo, um, they knew it. So, you know, there was this sort of artificial changing of names which confused people. In Osh, this is the first city I worked in here. Um, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was almost comical. I rented an apartment on the main one-way north-south street called Kumanjan Dakta, and uh, that was named for the so-called Queen of the South, who was a tribal chief who. Uh, ruled the region and tried to resist the Russians after her husband was murdered in 1862. So you know, the Kyrgyz decided, well, we're going to honor the Queen of the South by naming the main street after her. And we're actually going to replace Lenin, it was Ulitsa Lenina, with Kumanjan Dakta. But although Lenin was kind of usurped from the main um, um, one way South Street, he simply moved one block, um, uh, one block east, and he took over the main one way North Street. Okay, that's the sort of the downtown area of Osh. And uh, to make room for him, they had to push aside um, his one time Bolshevik comrade in arms, Yakov Sverdlov. So, you know, um, Ulitsa Lenina became. Uh, Kumanjandakta uh, Kuchazi, and um, 
Ulitsa Sverdlova became Ulitsa Lenina. So Lenin, Lenin still lived there. Okay, I'm going to kind of read you a couple of excerpts from postcards from Stanland now. I'll see how the time goes. I want to leave time for questions here. But to give you a little bit of a flavor of life, um, you know, especially in the mid late 1990s in, in, this, in this region. And the first one is called uh, Back in the USSR. <laughs> Be a great title for a song, don't you think? <laughs> um, my first meeting with the Dean of the Journalism Faculty at Kyrgyz State National University in Bishkek did not go well. I'd met Anisa Borobayeva while she was on a trip to the United States to visit journalism and communication schools. She said that if I was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship, her university would be happy to host me. <clears throat> I was excited about the prospect of teaching and working with new colleagues, but I wanted to avoid the mistake many Westerners working in developing countries make, telling people what they need, telling them what to do. I plan to listen and be sensitive. After a few minutes of polite conversation, I asked through the interpreter what I thought was the appropriate question. As Dean, what do you think the main needs of the journalism faculty are? Anissa looked uncomfortable. I really don't know, she said. I was hoping you could tell us what we need. And so the conversation went. I asked about the curriculum, the qualifications of the teachers, the facilities and equipment. On almost every topic, Anissa said she would rely on my expert judgment. As I left her office, she told me how proud she was to have a Fulbright Scholar on the faculty. The rector, Soviet Bek Toktomushev, they, they have these wonderful names, you know, Soviet Bek and Traktor Bek. Um, the university's chief administrative and academic officer had sent her a letter of congratulations. Her star was rising. After independence, Kyrgyzstan needed all the help it could find in almost every sector, including higher education. Western governments and international agencies provided scholarships to teachers for postgraduate study and dispatched a motley crew of teaching help from Fulbright scholars to Peace Corps volunteers to the universities. My colleague Martha Merrill, uh, now at Kent State University in Ohio, who's worked on higher education reform in Kyrgyzstan since the mid-1990s, and she was there at the same time I was, says the countries welcome almost every donor-funded initiative. Um, um, and you know they 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 you know so what you end up with is you end up with a real mix of stuff. So you have three bachelor degrees, probably coming from Britain or Australia, four year bachelor's degrees from the United States, five year diplomas. Uh, the result, as Martha puts it, is um, the Russian word is kasha, uh, literally in Russian that's porridge. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but in slang, a mess. In the 1990s, Kyrgyzstan more or less merited the island of democracy label that Western governments lavished on it. In contrast to some other a Central Asian republics where Moscow's rule had been replaced by a new authoritarian regime, Kyrgyzstan held elections that were generally considered fair and transparent. Its president, Askar Akayev, was a political outsider worked as a physicist in the Soviet era, the only Central Asian leader who had not been a Soviet apparatchik. There appeared to be a balance of power between the executive and legislative branches. Unfortunately, universities were still floating in an authoritarian Soviet sea. The rectors, like Dr. Mushev, were political appointees, and they lauded it over their fiefdoms like Soviet commissars or those medieval khans or emirs. Poorly paid teachers had little or no job security and little motivation to do more than show up for class. 
the old joke, um, the old Soviet joke, we pretend to work and you pretend to pay us seemed even more apt than in Soviet times because some had not been paid for months. Students had almost no say in what was going on. Um, in the 1990s, the economy and society of Kyrgyzstan were changing, albeit slowly, in state universities, unfortunately, um, they were still back in the USSR. Um, okay, I'm probably going to just skip this one and go to the $2.50 phone bill. And my wife's on this uh, Zoom call, so if she wants to butt in on this one, she can. Okay. Um, even for those with good language skills, getting things done in Kyrgyzstan was a challenge. A seemingly straightforward task, such as banking or paying a utility bill, often turned out to be a complex, time-consuming activity that required visiting several offices, filling out forms and slips of paper, obtaining signatures and stamps. Sometimes it involved waiting around for the only person authorised to conduct the transaction to return from lunch. A case in point was our phone bill. Living in the central district, our phone number began with the number 26. My wife Stephanie and I were told we were fortunate to have that number. Bishkek's Soviet-era telephone system was more reliable than most, but some exchanges in the city were notorious for drop calls and crackly lines. By contrast, the, the 2-6 exchange usually worked. It's all relative because there was always noise on the line, occasionally interrupted by mysterious clicking sounds. It could have been the secret police checking out our dinner plans, but more likely the creaking and groaning of the arthritic switching system. Although we claiming we had a working phone seemed a stretch, we still had to pay for it. The phone had already been cut off once because the bill hadn't been paid, but the landlord took care of it. We just received a recorded phone message and figured, we were still struggling with Russia at this time, that it was a reminder to pay the phone bill. So we brushed off the brushed up on our bill paying phrases and we headed off to the main post office. To pay the bill you first need to know how much you owe uh, and that's recorded on a printout on the table. We scanned through it but could not find our number. Apparently another customer had removed that page rather than make a note of the bill they had to pay. The post office staff said that they did not have another printout. They just take took money and gave receipts, but had no records. We were directed to the building next door where the records were kept, but the office was closed for lunch. We came back later, went up to the window for our station, number 26, and had the clerk enter the amount. Then we went back to the post office to pay and get a receipt and the obligatory official stamps. We'd spent almost two hours to pay a 41 som $2.50 bill. And then there were our trips to the bank to see if a wire transfer had arrived. But that's another story. Okay, I think we're going to do one more here, um, which kind of looks more towards the future. Um, if you want to leave Kazakhstan, learn English. If you want to stay, learn Chinese. What started as a joke in business and government circles has taken on a serious tone as China's economic, military and political clout in Central Asia has increased. <coughs> in the 19th century, China watched from the sidelines as Russian and British explorers, envoys and spies wandered around its western provinces and Tibet, mapping trade routes, building alliances with local leaders and hatching plots. The Chinese Empire, weakened by internal discord and rebellion, could not play in the so-called great game between the British and Russian empires. Today, the roles are, if not reversed, at least rebalanced, with China vying with Russia and United States in a new great game. Hungry for oil, gas and natural resources, 
China's invested heavily in Kazakhstan's energy sector. It built a pipeline to carry oil from the Caspian Sea uh, across Kazakhstan to Xinjiang, that's the Uyghur province, and is financing construction of a stretch of highway to connect China with Europe, uh, Europe, Russia. Um, uh, sorry, with Europe. Russia, Europe and the United States support pipelines running west to the Black Sea and Turkey. For now, there's plenty of oil to flow both ways, but the supply will not last forever. Analysts worry about population pressures. If its cities cannot accommodate more people, will China look west to the sparsely populated steppe of Kazakhstan? Um, Russia has long-standing economic ties with Kazakhstan. It's also the economic magnet for thousands of migrant workers from the region, especially from the poorer countries, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Um, remittances from migrant workers in Russia account for 29% of Kyrgyzstan's gross domestic product, 47% of Tajikistan's. Russia still provides aid and loan and maintains military bases in both countries. Um, um, you know, NATO and the US, um, and especially recently with the withdrawal of, uh, from Afghanistan, have very little military presence in the region anymore. Um, but economic interests are still pretty strong uh, in the oil, gas and mining sectors. Iran and Turkey are also in the game. Um, although only Turkey so far has invested heavily in the Central Asian economies and sought influence through education and social programs. So what happens in Central Asia as China, Russia, the United States, Turkey and Iran, and possibly India making a late entry to the game, compete will affect the world balance of economic and political power. As a journalist, Ahmed Rashid, author of two books on Central Asia, remarks, quote, One of the great dangers for the US and other Western powers will be continuing ignorance and neglect of what is happening there. The new great game is definitely on. So let me thank you so much, and I'm going to stop share here. Wow, I'm good on time. I want to do 45 minutes and, uh, and invite... Uh, uh, questions and comments and um, complaints or whatever. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, back 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 to you, Lindsay. I guess. All right. Thank you, David. Um, yeah. So, if anyone has questions, they can feel free to type them in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question. And my wife Stephanie's on here, so she she may want to correct something I've said. <laughs> I took those pictures of the little boys, and the I was the one that got that soap. All right, okay. So, and and I took a picture of the little boy in the in the um coal pack. Okay. Tree process. So, but that's okay. That's okay. Credit where credit credit where credit's <laughs> due. <there. laughs> um. David, question. You, you've talked about a lot of stands, but Pakistan sits kind of in there between India and China and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see a role for them in terms of the Great Circle game? Well, Pakistan, I mean, Pakistan's incredibly important, but it kind of lacks the resources to make too much of a difference right now. I mean, I, I think Pakistan's quite consumed by its own internal problems and relations with Afghanistan. So if, pa if Pakistan had the kind of economy that India had, which would enable it to, you know, invest in natural resources and banking and things like that, um, that would be, I think, an issue there. 
but it doesn't. I mean, you know, Pakistan is a relatively poor country that has to take care of its own people. So India is a much more likely player, I think, in the region there. Uh, that said, Pakistan remains a formidable military force. And so, um, and, you know, mostly, mostly resistant to India there. So if India pushes too hard into Central Asia, um, you know, Pakistan's going to, I think, be concerned by the geopolitical balance there and, and, and push back. But I mean, right now, you know, Pakistan's probably too concerned with fighting India over Kashmir and, and worrying about what's happening on the northwest frontier with Afghanistan. Afghanistan than to have much to do much to do in Central Asia. I, I, I think it uh, Pakistan in terms of its territorial ambitions is probably probably a bit too stretched. I mean that's just my um, kind of lowbrow wonkish view of view on the thing. But it's it's a good question. You know we have to sort of you know where does Central Asia include? That's a kind of an interesting question as well. And some people will definitely put Afghanistan into Central Asia and so um, what does and doesn't happen in with the Taliban in Afghanistan I think is going to be quite significant as well. So I guess that Pakistan kind of at one remove could have some influence there. I mean in northern Afghanistan, I mean the uh, a lot of the resistance to the Taliban first time around and more recently in the Panjshir Valley uh, was led by um, led by people who are, uh, are more Uzbek than uh, than than uh, uh, basically ethnic Uzbeks there. So it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it, you know, we should, we should not take our eyes off it. <laughs> Anything could happen there. And I mean, I think that uh, countries like Uzbekistan and the Kazakhstan again are kind of, kind of worried about, you know, what's happening in and what's happened in Afghanistan and whether that will spill over into their own countries. I mean, they they fought hard, I think, to stay as secular regimes and to repress um, Islamic movements quite brutally, I would say, in the case of Uzbekistan. So I'm sure they're kind of worried about what's happening in, um, in, in Afghanistan, especially if uh, sort of Taliban um, Taliban ideology spreads a bit more. Wow, I sound like I know some stuff about this. I guess I know a bit, you know. <laughs> Told me. Sounds like you know a lot. <laughs> yeah, you're easily impressed, John. <laughs> we have a, a comment in the chat uh, from a patron. Very interesting and helpful for us to begin to try to understand the game. Thank you very much. Okay, well, 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 well a, 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 ple a pleasure indeed. And I mean, as I say, I, I'm on a, a bit of a mission here to try to help people understand a part of the world. I mean, remember the New Yorkistan cartoon, which is sort of little, often overlooked and little un, 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 understood, you know? Um, so that, thank, I appreciate, appreciate the compliment there. Thank you. David, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to say when you were showing the maps of, um, of the way that the Soviets had divided up the countries yep. and the borders, talk, tell them about, tell them the story about when German was taking you from Osh to Bishkek or the other way around because of having to cross the borders. Ah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, if I, I I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pull up the map again there, but if you travel from Osh, which is the second largest city in Kyrgyzstan, to Bishkek, the capital, you've got to cross three mountain ranges. It's a long, long trip here. Uh, but the first part of the trip from Osh going north, you have to actually go across Uzbekistan. Or if you don't, it's a long way around. And that's always been a border where uh, the two countries are in 
are in conflict. So, you know, the, the Uzbeks will close the border or they'll suddenly decide you need a visa that you didn't need last week or there's a mysterious transit fee. Um, but even after you've crossed uh, that main border, there are little bits of Uzbekistan that uh, kind of poke into Kyrgyzstan. And I remember this one trip where we're driving and we get to the edge of a village and there's a border post ahead. It's an Uzbek border post. Now, it's just this tiny little sliver of land uh, that's Uzbekistan or claims to be Uzbekistan. And uh, my driver did not want to, you know, uh, go through the hassle at another Uzbek border post and then, you know, I'll probably have to pay a bribe. So just before we got to the village, you know, he turns off the main road and he drives, you know, on this, you know, this, you know, dirt track up, up a, up, up a, up a, a um, in West Virginia, we'd call them a holler, uh, up, up, uh, up one side of a, a, a creek, and then about a mile out, we kind of cross the creek and come back down the other side, avoiding, avoiding the border post, you know. But um, that, that, that was it. It's a crazy gerrymandered border, and when things get um, tense between the two countries. Uh, I mean, each country has something the other one wants. So the Uzbeks have natural gas, which Kyrgyzstan needs to, you know, to heat its homes and heat its factories. Um, Kyrgyzstan has a lot of water. It has uh, um, rivers which flow eventually some of them into the Aral Sea and Kyrgyzstan needs that water to irrigate its cotton fields. So there are these kind of, you know, energy and resource wars going on. So when tensions are high, you know, there'll be all sorts of trouble or minor trouble at the border and occasionally border guards have been known to physically move uh, their border posts, you know, 15, 20 yards, um, you know, further into Kyrgyz or Uzbek territory as a symbol of, I don't know, symbol of something or other. So yeah, it's uh, it, it's a kind of a crazy, crazy part of the world. I, the other thing I didn't mention there, I think it was one of the maps, is that uh, within Kyrgyzstan there are enclaves, these are areas of territory uh, for the other country. So Uzbekistan has three territorial enclaves in Kyrgyzstan. These are, um, you know, territory of Uzbekistan, which is completely surrounded by um, um, Kyrgyzstan. I think Tajikistan has a couple as well. So obviously, where you have a territorial enclave, that's another potential source of conflict and has not been sorted out because in order to get from your enclave like Sukh, which is part of Uzbekistan, to Uzbekistan proper, you're going to have to travel across 30 miles of, of Kyrgyzstan to get there. Makes no sense, but again, this is the um, this is the way in which the Soviets sliced and diced the region to try to repress ethnic minorities or ethnic groups. Um, um, if, if anyone um, has any last questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute. Um, but I'm going to include the link for um, the next program in the series, which is Three Journeys in Central Asia. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about it, David? Oh, you assume I have this presentation ready, do you, Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I absolutely so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what we're going to do now then is we're going to actually kind of take three trips. One is the one I was sort of just referring to, though, the other way around from Bishkek in the north of Kyrgyzstan across three mountain ranges. Uh, we're traveling in a larder, a rather small car with a couple of crates of vodka as ballast in the back uh, to travel on the snow. When we're traveling down to Osh in the south and we're going to go to the, um, the harvest festival there with traditional um, horse races and games. 
um, another journey will go um, um, east from Bishkek to uh, Lake Isikul, which is the largest uh, freshwater lake, um, it's the second largest in the world after Lake Titicaca in South America. Um, and we'll go to a place called Karakol, which was an early kind of Russian settlement there. And then the third trip is going to focus on um, Kazakhstan's um, I say new, it's not exactly new anymore, but Kazakhstan's rather bizarre capital, um, which was for many years was called Astana, means just capital in the Kazakh language, but was recently renamed Nur Sultan in honor of the retired president Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, which is a kind of, I, I mean, I lived there for six months in 2011 and it's kind of this sort of rather bizarre um, um, capital with lots of modern architecture but rather sterile at the same place. I kind of, I've seen the Hunger Games, I sort of compare it to the capital in the Hunger Games, it looks a little bit like that. Anyway, so uh, those would be the three journeys uh, that we would take, unless I change my mind between now and the presentation and do something else instead. Okay. <laughs> So um, patrons can click that link that's in the chat and um, register for the next series or the next program in the series. Um, thank you so much, David. This is great. Well, 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 thank you, Lindsay, and thank you to everybody for um, taking time tonight. And uh, I hope that uh, you know a little bit more about Central Asia than you did uh, an hour ago. So thank you so much, and I really appreciate the library. And by the way, I, I have to say that Lindsay has a real library background uh, there. Those are real books behind her, OK? I've done quite a few presentations where you can tell on the Zoom that it's a virtual background the library has. As, you know, oh, here's our books background. But those are real books. These are real books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you, David. Bye. Yes, bye.